All right. Good afternoon to those in the East and good morning to those in the West. It is Gary Morris from the DLC Group of Companies. And I'm so happy that you've tuned in for uh, this episode of the Level Up series. My my guest today is someone who uh, I think is extraordinary. I'm, I'm so happy to have him uh, with us. Um, a lot of you will recognize the name Riaz uh, Megji. Riaz has been an accomplished broadcaster, a media personality, uh, a host of um, you know many, many programs over the years. His 17 year career, uh, he's interviewed thousands of athletes, celebrities, business leaders, industry titans. You may have seen him on um, MTV, CTV, Breakfast Television, or speaking possibly at TEDx. In addition to his very, very storied career as a broadcaster, he's also a producer, a coach, and now an incredible author of this incredible book, Every Conversation Counts. Really excited to uh, talk. We're in an extraordinary time right now uh, with the pandemic. So I think timing uh, couldn't be better. Riaz, good morning and welcome. Gary, man, this is awesome to be here with you. Thank you for the generous uh, introduction. And thank you for having this message behind the book here on your podcast, which is just incredible what you've done in the past year uh, for, for everybody across the country. Well, thanks very much. And, uh, you know, it's interesting because you and I met a few years ago um, and you were always one of those guys that really seemed to uh, resonate. One of those people, when you met for the first time, you just go, wow, that was a really cool conversation. And there was a, there was an impact felt. And, you know, I know over the years you have interviewed thousands of uh, these these media, you know, celebrity business icon personalities, uh, as we've said, and, and you've really narrowed it down to the the power of extraordinary relationships. And, you know, now's a really good time to to talk about this. And maybe we just start, maybe we just start there. This last year has been like no other year. Uh, you know, the pandemic has been uh, very difficult. And I mean, now we're, we're, we're breaking through almost the one year mark and, you know, the end in sight uh, still isn't really clear. Uh, and there's been a lot of anxiousness and, and nervousness. Maybe just start with, you know, tell me, um, you know, sort of your position on what we've gone through and how challenging it has been. This, this is hard. And if we look at the past year, and if you're on this call listening to this and reflecting on what you've been through, what you're feeling right now, the biggest lesson I've personally learned and looked at as we've studied isolation and loneliness is that pandemics, they don't change your identity, they reveal it. Mm -hmm. And one of the biggest reveals that came out of this past year was how loneliness and isolation can impact us, not just mentally, but physically. And this was something that I had looked at for years pre-COVID. And every conversation I would have when it was interviewing people for a living, the profound thing that always stood out to me was one I was inspired by people that led with the courageous reveal. Not just like the biggest names or celebrities, but people that had faced great deals of adversity, whether that be uh, a life-threatening illness or a, a sudden loss in somebody's life. And what that means to suffer in silence. Mm -hmm. and how isolating that can feel. And I would study it, I would listen to it, and then I would look at how big this notion of loneliness existed, not only here in Canada, but around the world. And I wanted to help create a resource and dissect this idea of one, what drives loneliness, which we're all feeling right now, but two, how we can connect intentionally in meaningful ways, because now more than ever, that's what we need. Human connection isn't an option. We've learned it is a necessity. So you speak of that necessity and, you know, I've often said that it's relationships that drive every interaction in life. And I've said to, to our people on our team, uh, you know, if I point to one thing that, that is responsible for any difficulty in any area of our life, it's communication or the breakdown of communication. Uh, it's so important that we actually really learn how to authentically uh, connect with one another. So maybe just talk to me about why, why you think relationships are so important relationships are the foundation of productive conversation and if we look at the value of relationships right now given the culture and climate we're living in and what we've seen in the past year with polarization now more than ever we need to acknowledge each other we need to lift each other up and if we're going to have any type of productive dialogue or debate that starts with relationship because that is where trust is born. Mm. It is so easy to overlook or take for granted some of the interactions we're going to have on a daily basis and then fall into our autopilot mode of routines of, hey, Gary, what are we going to do today? Okay, what do we need to do next week? Okay, what's happening on the weekend? 
nothing's happening. We're in isolation and <laughs> lockdown. But how do we truly bring out the emotion in one another? That is our opportunity, whether that's curiosity, whether that's listening, whether that's empathy. Now more than ever, not just with their loved ones, I think about the culture and community you have with DLC. If you're trying to uh, create new business, if you're trying to win trust, relationship needs to be the priority now more mm. than ever. Yeah, yeah, no kidding. It's um, it's interesting. And before I uh, jump on to our next question, I just want to remind everyone, guys, that I'm giving away 50 of Riaz's books today. We're going to send it out. Uh, make a comment on social media, any one of the channels. Uh, if you want the uh, hashtag, it's hashtag uh, every conversation counts, ECC level up. Uh, and please tag myself personally, tag uh, Riaz. And if you want, if you have questions or comments, guys, share us as well. And um, Tara's going to do a random draw afterwards. So I was talking about these sort of fundamentals of building relationships. And it's interesting because, you know, they're so important in every area of our life. But you've sort of broken them down into five habits of human connection, right? The, the habits that one must master to build extraordinary relationships. And I thought it was really uh, interesting, actually, because as I read through the five habits, it was kind of an aha moment. They just sort of, I just said, finally, someone captured these in a systematic way because we can speak to people and we can give them our advice or our feedback, our experience, but actually having them, you know, so we receive them in a way that we can really understand them, implement them. So let's, let's walk through, I'm going to list out the five and then maybe you and I can go through every single one of the five uh, briefly. So the first one is listen without distraction. The second one is make your small talk bigger. The third one is put aside your perfect persona. The fourth one is be assertively empathetic. And I'm very interested in this one. And the fifth one is make people feel famous, which I think, uh, you know, we could write a book on ourselves. So let's start with the first one. Listen without distraction. I mean, what a great top topic now. The idea of listening is such an exercise we can all benefit from, myself included, every single day. And it's, it's not a new topic. These habits you outline, Gary, I, I'm hoping when people hear these, when they read about these, that these are reminders of the, the, the fundamental elements of how we communicate day to day, how we connect on a human level, how we build these relationships that we need. And with listening, the great challenge we have right now is the culture of traction we live in. We've known for years with the emergence of technology, we've moved into this culture of convenience. Mm. And we, we've moved into this culture of innovation, which is great, and disruption. But with all of that comes a great deal of distraction and the question to start asking ourselves of, okay, am I listening to what is being said? And am I also listening to what isn't being said? And that is difficult to do if we're caught up in distractions of re rehearsing our elevator pitch or we have our own agenda, thinking of that next witty comeback we're going to come you know, come in with as opposed right. to just leading with authentic wonder and curiosity. And some of the science and research we found in the book was that uh, our brains can absorb four to 500 words per minute, yet the average person speaks at a rate of 125 words per minute. And if you do that math, we're almost too smart for our own good. <laughs> if we don't channel that other 75% to give somebody the gift of undivided attention, we could be uh, coming in with a great intention to listen and then get caught up in, now I'm daydreaming. Okay, I, I disagree with you on that point. I'm getting emotionally charged and essentially shutting off and now I'm no longer listening. Or the technological distraction of, oh, I heard that ping. I gotta get to that email. Uh, mm. Gary, yeah, okay, keep going, Gary. Mm. And, and it's pulling me out of the moment. Mm. Now more than ever is that chance to really audit yourself on a daily basis and ask yourself, am I hearing somebody's not only words, but their emotion mm -hmm. and their intention? And the only way to do that is to truly combat these distractions that, that are prevalent for all of us. You know, it, I mean, I think we just have to really sort of absorb that. And do you know how many conversations we have all had in our life? We're talking to somebody and we know they're kind of half present. They're looking around and checking out other things. Or as you just said, they're quickly looking at their, you know, their messenger messages came in or a ping or a ring on their phone. Um, you know, a good friend of mine, Darren Harding, you've heard me say it before, says, guys, if you're not listening, if you're not fully present, if you're not absolutely locked in with your full body when you're having a uh, conversation, it is the equivalent of being stoned. You might as well smoke a joint right before you have a conversation because you are so far out there. You're catching, you know, at best 40 or 50 percent of the conversation. So what a beautiful message. Right. Be present all in and avoid those distractions to build a much more deeper relationship. 
Um, number two, make small talk bigger. This is uh, really impactful. Can you just uh, share your thoughts on that, please? Yeah, everybody hears about small talk and you think, oh man, I hate small talk. Yeah. And I'm gonna throw out this question just for you watching right now and listening to reflect on, why is it that you might have some resistance to small talk? Because if we break down what it is, for many of us, it's a defense mechanism to prevent ourselves from the embarrassment of getting emotional in front of someone we don't know. Mm -hmm. Or maybe it's it, it's a defense mechanism to prevent us from triggering someone that, that might be struggling or maybe grieving. So we, we make our own assumption of mm, they might react a certain way. So we start talking about superficial stuff, whether that's the weather, whether that's something, uh, you know, just transactional. The goal to make your small talk bigger in your daily conversation, in your daily email, in your video calls, is to focus on less information, more emotion. Mm. And if you think about that concept and then wonder, okay, well, how do I, how do I solicit, elicit that emotion from the person in front of me? Because that, that is where real connection happens. Gary, if we look at any presentation we watch or we're moved by, it's a story that contains some degree of emotion and you're gonna remember that because the brain connects with stories simply because they're emotional, um, uh, they're emotional content. And some of the questions, this is the critical mistake I would make for a living when I'd interview guests. I'd come up with all of my questions and then think, here's how the interview is gonna go. And then I would, my success indicator was, I asked all of my questions, that was great. Mm -hmm. And as the years went by, I recognized if I'm rehearsing that elevator pitch, if I'm just going through the questions that I had planned, I'm missing out on that moment to understand what that person's priorities are. Mm -hmm. And one of the questions I would ask in the green room with any guest, no matter how much I prepared, because I would say one of the philosophies I have is over prepare, to improvise. Mm. Your preparation is going to give you confidence with any loved one or important client you're going to have, but your ability to lean in, listen, and improvise with what they're giving you and then navigate that emotion, that is where powerful connection happens. And I would simply just throw out the question when I'd see people in the green room or even you know catch up with someone I haven't seen in a while of, hey, so what's on your mind? Mm. And it's such a simple baseline question, yet the initial response they give you for the listener, we begin to understand where their priorities lie. And then we, with our own curiosity, can prioritize their priorities. Mm. And, and as I'm describing this, Gary, I, I guarantee you there's going to be somebody saying, okay, what if I don't have ch the, the, the chance or time to prepare beforehand and I'm in a room with the Gary Morris and okay, this is my chance to impress the big boss. I'm going to invite you listening to this to stop thinking about how you can impress somebody because you can't impress anybody unless you understand them first. Mm -hmm. And if you want to make a memorable impression and if you want to make your small talk bigger, think about the questions we can ask to unlock somebody. And the late psychiatrist Gordon Livingston, he had a great equation of what happiness is. And I personally call this the happiness hat trick. If you have no information and no context on the person in front of you, uh, Gordon Livingston outlined that the happiest people have someone to love, something to do, and, and something to, to look forward to. Mm. And if you have no context and you're wondering, how do I connect? Ask people about those three areas and watch them light up and then navigate that emotion they give you and then start asking for stories, not just answers. We don't want just information. We want emotionally rich stories that will bond the two of you and make that small talk enormous. Yeah, thanks for the share on that, amazing. It's uh, it's funny because I think maybe he was the first, the same gentleman that said in your book, in your book, you had actually said that it is statistically proven that if you increase your friendship by 50%, if you actually just bring in more social interaction, you are much happier than any, any, any financial success could bring you. And I found that very powerful, right? Just having more conversations that are authentic and genuine. I want to say two quick things here. Um, so, so number one, um, Certainly not the big boss, as far as I'm concerned. That everyone on this call, I work for them. They don't. They don't work for. They don't work for me. I work for, I work for them. I like that. And 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 more than the CEO, I think you'd probably you know maybe call me the EIEIO. So we. Uh, it's all about you know. It's all about just you know having some having some fun. The other thing I want to say is that I know my mom 
saw my uh, Facebook um, notification this morning about you coming on. And she said, oh, I'm so excited. And she sent me a message. She goes, Gary, you're so cute. So I know mom's listening. And mom has been on me for years saying, oh, Gary, no small talk, doesn't like small talk. And so it's funny because as I hear you, I have to myself just remind myself every day, you know, the value of, of those conversations, right? And to make them bigger. So, hey, mom, I'm going to work on doing a way better job. Um, Mama Morris, love um, to Mama Morris. Hey, Gary, yeah. Gary can, I can I jump in with something? Because sure. I, I, I want to recognize you for a, a special moment. And, and if people are wondering, well, how, how, did, how did we meet? Gary and I met in a cave in Mexico. That was our first conversation together. And I had the opportunity to present for mortgage architects at the time for, for their conference. And somebody said to me, hey, you, you should meet Gary uh, from DLC. And I know that you've done amazing work. The, the community is uh, a great leader, uh, community of ambassadors across, across this country. And when we talked that night, you said something to me that sticks with me to this day because you said, hey, I appreciated what you did on the stage for our group tonight. Is this a one-off or do you see something bigger happening here? And I smiled because at the time my full-time gig was broadcasting and I personally had been making excuses not to just dive in and, and fully just take this leap of faith and go for it. And I said, you know, it's, it's something I'm going to build. And you stopped me in my tracks and you said, you can play at a much bigger level. What you did can be on a bigger stage. And then you gave me an invitation to be with your community and your group in Whistler, BC, when Darren Hardy, who you mentioned, took the stage. And he presented, incredible presenter. I love what Darren does. But you provided the opportunity for me to chat with Darren. And something he said to me has stuck with me for years of how I show up, how I connect, how I listen, how I make my small talk bigger. And I had asked Darren because, uh, I mean, if you're watching, you've probably seen Darren. Uh, I, I know he was on uh, the Love Love podcast. Yeah, he's a dear friend but of mine. With, yeah, and he, he's, a, he's, he's a great friend of yours. And when I asked Darren, and being an interview for a living and respecting how he's interviewed some of the greats out there and studied Diane Sawyer and, and studied Oprah, I said to Darren, what's your technique? Like, what do you do to unlock somebody to take that relationship deeper? And he smiled and he said two words, go first. And I thought about those two words and I said, go first. I'm like, tell me about that, Darren. Like, what does that mean for you? How does that show up for you? And he said, if you want to motivate somebody, find out what motivates them and help them achieve that. Go first. He wow. said, if you want to build trust in your relationship, show you trust them first mm -hmm. and create that safe space so then they can openly share. And that goes in line with one of the habits of the book of putting aside your perfect persona. The first step is to just go first. If you've got to call somebody you haven't called in a long time, how can you go first with something they told you maybe a month, a year ago, in a detail you documented that was unique to that conversation? Instead of saying, hey, uh, Gary, hope you're well in an email. Hey, Gary, that Level Up podcast with Darren, when you guys talked about uh, never letting a good crisis go to waste. Right. Man, that that was imp that stayed with me. Immediately, you've shown that person I listen to you, mm. and yeah. you're, that's going to create some reflective reciprocity of how you connect and and, and, and how you play off each other. So, thank yeah. you for that yeah. uh, that wow. cave conversation. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and thank you for 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 sharing that. It, it brings back uh, great joy thinking about that. Uh, it's it's been a while for sure. Uh, it's interesting because you talk in your book about going first, and and going first represents in leadership as well. And you talk about um, the NBA commissioner Alan Silver, who actually shut down. He was the first sports uh, network or league to shut down and say, "Whoa!" They had one positive test, and he shut down the entire NBA season. And of course, we know what happened. Every sport in the world soon followed him, right? So, you know, going first is a great example right there. So, uh, thank you for sharing that. So, so the, the the third habit that you speak of is put aside your perfect persona. Um, I think I sort of represent that a little bit. I, I'd like you to maybe, you know, give us your thoughts on what that means to you. This is what we need now with our teams, with our people. If we want to connect and we want people to share, uh, the big challenge with revealing our truth or opening up is that we all innately have this sense of belonging. Mm -hmm. And if we share our truth, there's a fear we might be alienated if somebody disagrees with us and we might lose that self of belonging. So we keep our struggles uh, to ourselves and we fall into this trap. 
But the notion of going first as a leader, of creating that space of saying, ask me anything right now. And the notion of maybe onboarding people in a remote setup, which is going to be our reality for a while. I've had leaders say to me, how do I create that connection when they don't have the physical touch points they would with water cooler conversations or running into somebody in the hallway? And if they're going first, imagine you're a new recruit, you're joining DLC, you're nervous, and you have, uh, I'm still calling you the big boss, Gary, whether you take it or uh, you have Gary, Gary saying, hey, on my first day, here's what I was terrified about. Mm -hmm. And then they think I don't have to be alone with this anxiety. He's just opened up the vault. Mm -hmm. And if I share this, I'm not going to alienate myself. I I'm going to be in this space. But as, as we do that, the important thing to consider, th th there's a psychological term known as the pratfall effect, where uh, going first with our vulnerability is effective when we've established our, you know, our credibility and, and strength first. Right. And if we're seen as that source of strength and then lead with that vulnerability, we're going to draw people closer to us. They're going to feel safe and then they're going to open up. Right. But if people are questioning our competence already and we're not seen as that, 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 that leadership role or, or that point of respect, that, that notion of going first can backfire and lead to an overshare. So really understanding who our audience is, are they... Uh, uh, um, open and, and available and, and ready to accept this vulnerability? And then have I established that, that credibility? Th these are really important factors to, 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 to create these bonds. Oh, that's really interesting because we speak of that all the time and, and just being your, you know, introspective and, and, and humble and, and vulnerable, but, but, you know, I never thought of it that way. Make sure before you do that you're at the level where you actually have the endorsement or the acceptance or the credibility already, because, you know, you don't want to lead with, oh, my dog just died and I'm having a horrible, you know what I mean? Like, we're not looking for that kind of vulnerability, right? We're looking for, you know, honesty and authenticity, but, you know, uh, there is a fine line between oversharing actually. So thank you for uh, illuminating that. Very cool. Yeah, it's, it's always thinking about if I'm going to share this, and maybe th this is the, the the presenting aspect that comes in. How is this going to help the audience? How is this going to motivate them? How is this going to energize them? And if it's something that's very difficult, uh, knowing that how how are they going to receive this? Anticipating, thinking about them as much as you know you're thinking about yourself. And that's why in, in the beginning of the book, I always say, "Look at you," is so much more important than "Look at me." Mm. And finding that balance and serving the person in front of you, the service mentality is crucial when it comes to connection. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, number four uh, on the habits is be assertively empathetic. When you hear that, Gary, be assertively empathetic, what, what comes to your mind before I get into this? You know, I think you have to, you know, I mean, Empathetic is an incredible, uh, you know, tool. And I think it really connects us with people. Um, I think you have to be uh, very careful, though, not to be uh, too empathetic or where you can be actually uh, taken advantage of. I think you, you know, there's a level of being on guard, um, you know, uh, while you're being empathetic. And, you know, I'd like to hear your thoughts on it because, you know, um, I know your your your, your opinion is, is much deeper than that. But let's hear what you say. This notion of empathy provides uh, such value to, to let the conversation or connection breathe. Mm. And it comes down to the philosophy that relationship is the foundation for you know, any, any productive conversation. If we get into a moment where things could be tense, maybe we disagree, mm. maybe emotions are heightened. The philosophy behind be assertively empathetic comes down to relationship first, logic second. Mm -hmm. Because one of the greatest things that we all need, uh, not only with our sense of belonging, is to be seen and to be heard. And if we're going to put the relationship first, acknowledge that person. Right. Regardless of their position, acknowledge them. And that involves listening without our emotional distraction. I mean, it, this has been a tough year for a lot of people. Imagine if you have to convey uh, news to somebody that they're, they're going to lose their job. For us, we can get caught up in how difficult it is to, to, to relay that news and lose sight of how difficult it is to receive that new outcome. Mm. Acknowledge them. Yeah. And what if you relay that news and they say nothing? Mm. Sometimes silence 
can be so profound, yet we interrupt it and stumble over it with our own filler words because we're uncomfortable with the silence, but letting that silence do the talking. Mm, yeah. And if that silence persists, then lead in with that curiosity that hits on emotion of, you know, how are you feeling about this right now? Mm. And be where they're at. And when they start talking and they start sharing in the relationship, establish that, you know, that commonality and make sure you recap and understand what you've heard of where they're at. And when we move along with the, the commonality, then it's a matter of focusing on what we can agree on. Because the most important thing in any relationship, regardless of position, regardless of the polarization, is to sit here and say, Gary, it's me and you versus the challenge versus Gary, it's me against you. Right. And that's such a simple distinction, but it's such an important distinction if we're going to have productive dialogue when we have differing perspectives. Mm -hmm. Because it's that, that diversity of curiosity that will elevate all of us in this space of how we innovate because we're moving at a rapid pace right now. And then we can end with logic if we're still in differing perspectives to ask questions like, mm -hmm. tell, you know, what does your ideal scenario look like here? Mm -hmm. what's, what's the real challenge here for you? Mm -hmm. And what would it take for this to work for you? Mm -hmm. And when we hear those responses, when we lead with empathy, then we begin to dissect where the real challenge lies. If that's what the person, is that what the project, is that what the process? And that will get us to more productive outcomes. Yeah, it's really interesting that you uh, that you express that because I always say to people, right, solve for the emotion, not for the problem, right? When you're in an elevated situation and and there's a breakdown or, or there's a problem or you've underdelivered, you know, or the consumer thinks or your customer thinks you've underdelivered, so many of us want to be right, right? We want to just say, no, no, but you said this and you said this and you said this. And the only thing you're doing is you're inflaming the situation. You know, two things, respond quickly, run towards the problem, right? Very, very important, but solve for the emotion. And I think I look back at my answer when you asked me that question, and I thought, wow, did I blow it? But I absolutely understand now with your explanation of what that means. And, you know, it, it's it's important to, to, you know, to really make sure that we realize the emotional message behind, you know, sort of that, 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 you know, roadblock or, or that debate that you're having. So yeah, very, uh, very powerful. Thank you. And you know what, Gary, to build on that, of <laughs> before I got married, I got a bunch of advice. You know, when you get married or you have a kid, everyone is ready to give advice given their life experience. But somebody said to me, hey, make sure when you're communicating with your wife, you're asking yourself, do I want to be right or do I want to be in a relationship? Right. <laughs> and, that, and that always stuck with me because, Gary, you know my wife. She's uh, yeah. you know, a high-powered yeah. entertainment lawyer. I'm going to yeah. lose every debate that happens. So yeah, I want to stay in the relationship. Yeah, 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 yeah. And Lori is good. Nico's good. And everything's that good at home this last year. You're, you're obviously spending lots of time together. Yeah, we, we've had such a deeper understanding of who we are as people. One, a, a, as a couple, how we work together in a marriage. Two, how, how we parents. Our, our son is just over two years old. Thanks for asking. And I, I, it's a state of gratitude because when we talk about loneliness and to have them by my side working through this time, uh, it, it's a joy to watch the evolution of a child and any parent out there, I'm sure can, can, you know, share that sentiment of what that means and how lucky we are uh, to be in a state of gratitude with family. Oh, look at that. There's some photos right there. Dave, thanks for bringing those wow, up. Wow. Look at that little, he's so cute. Oh my goodness. Wow. Yeah, no, it's, it's funny because this last uh, year has been uh, remarkably good for many relationships because you spent spent more time together, but it's also been remarkably, you know, challenging for others, right? So you have, you know, sort of it going one of two ways. Uh, the other thing is you're going to have this baby boom probably, or you're going to have this, you know, massive division of of separation. There's going to be two camps on this, and you know, and and that's why I think this conversation today is is uh, so impactful and so well timed. Um, the last, uh, and I want to hit the, the the fifth habit of human connection is make people feel famous. I love this one. This, this, uh, you know, listening without distraction and making people feel famous perhaps are, are, are two of my favorites. They're all, they're all my babies. Like you, you, yeah. you can't choose one, but with make people feel famous, this was an objective I had every single day when I'd interview people and not just interview people, but just meet and, and, and network with each other. And it really comes down to the philosophy that we all need a champion in our life. Mm. We all need someone that's going to say, I see what you're doing. Like, Gary, I recognize the community you've built through this podcast. I appreciate how you've served 
the community. And I look, I messaged you last year when I saw what you're doing with Dr. Drew, with Darren Hardy, Lewis Howes on here, uh, Jim Tree Living you had on here. And I said, the thing I've always respected about you is the generosity you give, the humility you show to level up your people. Like it's the perfect name for your podcast because, you know, I was talking to a great curator in the city, Jordan Kalman, last night from Social Concierge, and he puts on these great events. He's a design experience expert. And we were talking about the notion that generosity always wins. Mm. That's you, man. That mm. sentiment captures you in my eyes. And, and to have this space to share these habits, I hope people are connecting in deeper ways after they watch this. But it, it, it's it's a notion for all of us when we look at the opportunity for praise. I hear more than ever, and people have a pure intention with two words, hey, great job. Yeah. <laughs> because they, they want to celebrate their people. But what if we took it deeper with our praise? And instead of saying great job, because that's so subjective and you wonder, okay, well, how great was it? What What was the impact? How do we make our praise more specific? How can we reference, like I'm telling you, that moment with Darren Hardy when you guys talked about never waste, a, a, let a good crisis go to waste, yeah. to, to practice specificity in our praise, to, to make it public like you do. You celebrate your champions on social media, to make it urgent, you don't wait, right. and to make it personal on a personal level. Your conversation, our conversation in a cave in Mexico <laughs> yeah. ends with me to this day because you were one of those that made me feel famous saying, I believe you could play on a bigger stage. Yeah. And when you have cats like you that play at this high level, that see something and imposter syndrome's real mm -hmm. to write a book and put something out there, you wonder, you, you come in with an intention to serve. You don't know how it serves until an audience tells you, mm -hmm. this is how you changed my life. Yeah. But when you have believers and you can lift people up and make them feel famous, the whole culture will change because we rise to the influence of the company we keep. Mm. And that's what we need right now. We need champions like you, more of you, Gary, out there doing this for the world. Well, thank you. You're so unbelievably kind. It's it's funny, uh, Riaz, because I know you, uh, your fire gets lit with the same thing. For me, it's it's always about the ignition, right? Like finding somebody who has got to a point in their life where they're ready to receive, just for whatever reason, they've heard this, or they know they should have done this, or they can get better in relationships, or whatever it happens to be that will take them to the next level, personal development. But until they're ready to actually receive, you can actually see it when you have a conversation and you ignite that flame. You can just see it. And then all of a sudden they start reaching out like 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 you did and like others have. And, you know, I had those impactful people in my life as well. So it's funny because I have a group of, I'm I, believe it or not, I'm actually mentoring uh, a group of 50 brand new mortgage brokers, the new to the industry. And they were talking on social media about not getting kind of the mentorship that they needed at wherever they're at. Some came from competitors, some were some of our offices. So I jumped in and I'm doing this. And, and we're having all of these conversations right now every single week. And it's a terrific group. I'm making this group of, of, of 50 newbie mortgage professionals into just business assassins. And the next question that I want to ask you about, and I want to explain, uh, I'd like your, your feeling is that there's some real social anxiety out there. I mean, I talked to this group, but I talked to, you know, our highest performing professionals in the country. And it's funny, they're still uncomfortable with maybe calling their past customers or, or making a phone call and calling somebody new, wanting to build a relationship, maybe a new referral source. And they give me like feedback and excuses. Like, I don't want to become too salesy or the conversations are very awkward or the phone feels like it has, you know, it weighs 5,000 pounds. I mean, it is really, really hard. And and I share this right now because I remember something in the book and you talked about like just it's, you know, we grow up this way as as children, you know, when at our youngest ages in our teens, we would say to our buddies, go tell that girl that I like her. Right. Or go tell that girl that, you know, that I want to say hi. Right. Even back then, we it was so hard to just make those new conversations. So what I'd like to ask you is how do you overcome that social anxiety? What are the first steps for anyone on this call that just goes, you know what, like I'm okay in my own little bubble, but how do I start new relationships and build new friendships and call on people that maybe aren't expecting me? Mm. Wow. I love how you took it back with the nostalgia of what it's like growing up. Uh, yeah, I was I was an introvert. I was socially awkward. I, I couldn't talk to people, uh, especially girls and Here's, here's the great observation that I've made when it comes to the word, you've used the word excuses. Mm. If we look at how excuses show up in our life, what are they? Excuses are unconscious assumptions of the way something is going to go. 
And for people that say, I don't have time, um, what if this doesn't work? Uh, I don't have the discipline to get this done and make that call. It's not that they don't have time, focus, or discipline. It's that they don't have necessity. That's step one. Ask yourself, do you need to make that call? Because if you don't, chances are you're going to make an excuse. Mm-hmm. If we're trying to identify the unconscious assumptions that, that exist in our lives, where does necessity show up? And then if we're playing uh, the, the game of understanding, well, how are these excuses serving me? I've rolled through a, a list of questions even before making that call or using any of these habits to connect of, okay, what is the worst thing that could happen here? And answer that. What is the ideal outcome that could come from you know reaching out and making that call? What's the most realistic? And then finally, I plan for that realistic one. Mm-hmm. The imposter syndrome of psyching ourselves out that this outcome is not going to happen. Once we actually take inventory of what's leading to this thought process of our unconscious mind stalling us, we'll slowly start to realize and then take inventory of the great calls you've had I document the, the reasons that are blocking you, but then document the, the success stories for you. Yeah, I, I think about the idea as you bring this up, Gary, of people that have public speaking anxiety of how they think it's going to crash and burn and it's going to fail. But if you look at all those moments where, where you were the star and you own that spotlight, look at what, what worked for you there and focus and tell yourself that narrative of how you were that champion then and inspire yourself. To answer your question, it really starts with identifying your unconscious assumptions, and that's just taking an inventory. That if that is you listening on this call, where you're getting, you're blocking yourself. Take a pen and paper today and write down why you think these things, or why somebody might react that way, and think about when it happened in your life, why it happened, and why, given the experience you have now, that outcome's probably going to be a lot different now. Mm. And once we do that. These, these, these connections, these calls could go in a completely different direction. The self-awareness factor has to completely change mm-hmm. to break through this barrier you're introducing. And it's funny, you know what? We always regret what we don't do. We never regret what we do do. And, you know, anyone who does them and breaks through that just goes like, we know that building any area of our life, I mean, you know, it involves some some suffering right i mean it's been it's it's proven studies you have to embrace the suffering in order to, to move forward and you got to be able to fight through it and you know one of the things that i always say to people are you stronger than your excuses right you know because your excuses there's a million of them for them right i mean give yourself some time and you'll give every excuse and you'll start to believe them but it's just do it it's just you know like nike was so forward thinking when they said just do it you know what i mean early on and uh, you know it's important i always say to people right like fear does not stop death fear stops life Right. So anything you're afraid of is what you should be doing most of. Right. Because that is where you'll have the greatest, greatest growth. So, you know, thank you for that. And Andrea, as we'll actually do, I think we'll do maybe a, a takeoff series on this, just focusing around that social anxiety about, you know, building relationships and reaching out to people. Because, you know, once you just throw yourself in the fire and just go, I'm all in, like Lewis Howe said it best. He was great. He goes, you know what? I prefer to be in a room, have every single person say every, every negative thought about me. I'm, I'm old. I'm gray. I'm fat. I'm not smart. I was raised by a single mother, but whatever it happens to be, bring it on because you can't hurt me. Right. And once you get to that point and you believe it, that nobody can say anything that's going to hurt you because quite frankly, it doesn't matter. It's a very, very liberating place to be. So absolutely incredible. Mm. As you describe that, the two words that stand out and the greatest words and and maybe lesson I learned to survive a cutthroat media industry and take that and build that thick skin, validate yourself. Mm validate yourself. And there is a a big difference between somebody that is a presenter and speaker or or even a leader that is a giver and a taker. Where are, Are they going into that space because they need validation from the group or are they going into the space to give motivation to their people? Yeah. And the, and the best way to be in that space of providing that service mentality and providing that motivation validate yourself. And once you're able to do that, and I'm not saying that in an egotistical way, I'm saying that in a way of asking for that feedback, asking, asking your trusted circle, like, look, the virtual calls we're doing, every single interview I ever did on TV, every virtual call, I watched the playback and I will validate myself before I open it up from feedback from somebody else by asking them the question, what was most useful for you? And then in a trusted circle, I'll get the high-level players <laughs> to, uh, you know, just 
just go at me and say, you know what? You missed that moment here. This didn't really come across, but that's how you get better. Building that idea of, okay, it's not against me. It's with the intention somebody might have to lift me up and be open to it and acknowledge what they're saying. That's that empathy thing coming in again. Uh, they have an intention to help you. They're not against you. Mm. And, and being open to listening, staying open is, is so valuable if yeah. we're going to grow and, and, and build our relationships. Let's talk about how important words are, right? And making the extra effort. I always see, you know, speak to people about words that work. And I say to people, if you ever send a Christmas card that says Merry Christmas, never send it again. Save yourself all the money, right? Like Merry Christmas. It's just, there's so much, it's just numbness, noise. You know, I get 50 of them a year. Thank you for taking the, making the effort. But, you know, there's so much more powerful. The Christmas card said, you know, Gary, I was thinking about you all year. You're one of the, you know, the, 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 the joys in our life that we met this year. I look forward to getting to know you better in 2021. Uh, please say hello to your wife, Janice, and your son, David. Like that to me takes a little bit extra time, but it has so much more power in it. I say to people like the disease on social media right now is likes. Like is the easy man's way just to think that they're maybe staying in touch. Rather than saying a like on somebody's post, why don't you actually go on their post and make a comment about what's going on in their life, about and a real heartfelt, authentic comment. Then all of a sudden you realize they start commenting on you. And now you actually really are start building a, 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 a very good, like, like people just get, thank you, great, okay, you know, congratulations. And you, you touched on it a few minutes ago. Can we drill down on just going the extra mile on actually words in every conversation? And I'm going to use your words. Every conversation going the extra mile works. They all count. Oh, man, this is so good. As, as you talk about uh, how, we're, how we're using social media and how we can use our words. The, the late uh, pioneer of loneliness research, Dr. John Cassiopo, looked at technology and looked at how we're engaging with such a powerful tool. Is it enhancing connection or is it destroying it? And he found, and, and I'll, I'll summarize his philosophy, it's creation over consumption. Right. We can use this medium to engage instead of the likes, instead of just the, 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 the shares or the retweets, but to create meaningful face-to-face -face connection. If we can't do it in person, use the power of video mm. and, 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 and practice that specificity to learn from someone that's inspirational, like you're doing with the Level Up podcast, uh, to, to have a framework that you could use and internalize. And, and then social media, it's bringing you up. But if we're just consuming passively, uh, Dr. Cassiopo found that's where those feelings of being inadequate really start to set in. And that's a dangerous place to be as we're just admiring what everybody else is doing, thinking they don't care about us. But if somebody, and if you're going to comment on this conversation today, I invite you to comment on something Gary said. Maybe th there's something of value I've provided that, that stood out to you and make it specific and use that exercise in your life where if, if you're speaking to the, the Christmas card of what Gary's saying, always be storytelling. Remember a moment with that person in the past year, if, if it's a holiday card, mm -hmm. that, that m made a difference in your yeah. life. That, that's what's going to move people. And Gary, one of the things I've been changing during the pandemic is if it's somebody's birthday, instead of sending them a text <laughs> or a LinkedIn, hey, wish this person happy birthday, I'm shooting a video and I have a cheat code because my son Nico is the bringer of joy. I'm <laughs> in the video with them and he can't say happy birthday, but he's got his own rendition. Bam. I'm bringing my family into this, into this lens with you to let yeah. you know, I'm thinking about you. I love you. You matter. And we have this powerful vehicle of video that's it's underused right now. Yeah. 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 Thank you. You know, what's so right. It's just, uh, I find people that just, you know, what, like they, as we said, they, well, you, I mean, you demonstrated it perfectly. You got on here and you actually told all of our, our listeners about the, you made the effort about the extraordinary conversation that you and I had and we connected in that game in, in Mexico. And and you have to, to really connect with people. You have to really resonate on an emotional connection, right? You know, we call it expected unemotional connections, building ring fans. And it's not difficult as long as it's genuine. And as long as you're authentic and as long as you're resonating with a previous conversation or a connection that you have in common, it is much more powerful than just saying, great, you know, congratulations, well done. You have to go the extra mile. Um, I want to talk about, about uh, one thing really quickly and, and and um, because I, I know how you sort of live your life, but for me, 
one of the most powerful tools out there that is underutilized is the power of gratefulness, right? Being appreciative and grateful to others. And, you know, like people love doing things, love making introductions, love helping you, love going the extra mile to anyone who is just, just grateful. So before I actually get your opinion on it, I'm incredibly grateful to our sponsor, First National. They believed in our company from day one. Um, you know, the group over there is extraordinary. Uh, they've just been such a beacon of support for the Canadian finance. So uh, first, Nat, to my pals over there, I know a lot of your uh, team is on here listening to this broadcast. Thumbs up and uh, thanks very much. So Riaz, now tell me the power of gratefulness in your mind and how do we exercise it? And 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 does it matter as much as, as what I believe it matters? Yes. Gratitude <laughs> and being in this state of gratitude is essential for our health and mindset right now. Some of the research that uh, I discovered in this book was that the habit of gratitude, and this is something you can try at home for, for you watching or listening to this, to start your day and write down three things you are grateful for. I, I, we don't need a whole page, but just three simple things. Research had shown that if you do that for 21 days, you will create an optimistic mindset for up to six months. And the wow. simple idea of reframing, Gary, you talk about the power of words, reframing what we do on a daily basis instead of saying, man, I, I have to do this podcast with Gary, level up. I have to be here and pick up my son and uh, I have to you know, get this food ready for my wife. Switching the words. There was a conversation I had with a gentleman by the name of Chris on the downtown east side in Vancouver. And years ago, uh, the whole way house had this initiative to bring in those that had lost their way and give them a second chance. And for a year, Chris would keep in his room. This is pre-COVID. He would stay in his room, wouldn't talk to anybody. They'd invite Chris down. He had been you know, uh, alienated from his family. He, he lost his sense of worth. But after a year of consistency, the whole way house said, come join us. You're part of this community. And they had a great project called the I Get To Legacy Project. <laughs> and think of the power of those three words of right. shifting from I have to to I get to and how that shifts your energy, how that shifts your feeling. And if you can document, I get to for three things every given day, watch how that changes how you feel mentally, what your energy is different, how your energy is different, how that impacts your well being, and then how you're giving energy to the people around you. Gratitude, I'm so glad you touched on, Gary, is a huge, huge part of connection. Well, it's really funny because I get to, I, I mean, I, 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 boy, you know, you and I are, are reading the same stuff or are, are focusing on the same speakers because I literally said to my management team yesterday, they go, oh my God, we're so busy and stuff's going on and it's chaotic and it's crazy. And I go, guys, we get to deal with this. We get to learn this. Like, are you kidding me? Like, this is, this is, this is higher education. Right. Like, you know, those people in fitness, they go, well, I don't want to go out for a walk today. Well, we get to walk as opposed to many others that don't. Right. So thank you for bringing that up and reminding of such an extraordinary uh, message and, and strategy. Um, we were talking about I talked about uh, Dr. Drew just a little bit at the front of this. And and Dr. Drew, uh, when he was on my program, he said uh, there's a lot of mistakes going on right now. He said, you know, a lot of us think we're doing our. Uh, our seniors and our parents good by keeping the grandkids away, thinking we're protecting them. And they said that the average, um, you know, senior that goes into a senior facility, the life expectancy is 18 months, and yet we're making decisions for these people. He also talked about um, the the devastation that the damage, um, you know, around living a life in social isolation, uh, social isolation right now. Uh, we haven't even begun to see the catastrophic damages, the the suicide, the self harm, the lack of confidence. Um, you know, going forward, I'd like your thoughts on that, Riaz. And you know, I know you're a fan of uh, Dr. Drew, so it's it, it's it's critical thinking right now that we all need to consider. The Rush Institute for Healthy Aging really looked at the impact of isolation, chronic loneliness when it when it sets in and how it impacts us on a, a physical level for our health. An elevated heart, uh, a risk of heart disease was a huge factor. Elevated risk of Alzheimer's. Gary, you mentioned it, the suicide, right. early death. And it's been so widely documented with isolation and loneliness that it is the equivalent of smoking 15 cigarettes a day wow. for people that don't have someone to reach out to. And some of the driving factors, Cigna, another health research firm, they looked at the four driving factors of loneliness being lack of social support, 
uh, poor negative perception of your own relationships, uh, you know, the work-life boundaries, and just, yeah, poor mental and physical health that we've, you know, we've talked about and we've covered in this hour. We need to take these things seriously because that mental health conversation will be the post-pandemic conversation. And if we underestimate the impact of missing out on connection and these touch points and nurturing our relationships, there could be suffering post-pandemic that's more extreme than what we're experiencing right now. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I think the the takeaway on that is to uh, do your part, guys, you know, uh, show that you care, um, you know, find two or three people that you haven't connected with a long time, maybe you're seniors and 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 start a conversation. I'm going back to the title of the book, right? Every conversation counts. Uh, reach out, be that beacon for somebody, uh, give them some hope and help them get through this really, really difficult uh, time. So uh, thank you for sharing that. Uh, Riaz, as we sort of wind down over the last few minutes, um, Maybe share with us, you interviewed thousands of people over the years. Was there was there one or two interviews that you just thought were extraordinary that had an impact on your life? Are you just your best interview? Mm. <laughs> that That's so funny you asked that question because as the interviewer, I would always ask that question too. And then I'd realize like you see some of these moments with Shaggy, J-Lo, Tom Cruise. <laughs> Having the celebrities is great, but... You know, even Gary Vaynerchuk, I remember he said to me, you know, what's the secret to making every conversation count? And he didn't hesitate when he said, give more than you take. I just admire, and I don't mean for this to be a dodge because I just don't want to discount all of the value of the conversations that were given to me. Uh, I'll, I'll, okay, I'll give you one. And it was Dr. Uh, Wayne Dyer, the late one. Oh, yeah, of course, yeah. You know, thought leader of a generation, didn't do much press. Uh, towards his his later years, but when he was in Vancouver, I hounded his publisher. I think it was Hay House at the time, and I said, "We got to get him on the show. He's here presenting in Vancouver. Let's do it." Yeah, there he is. Thanks, Dave. And they obliged, and he came into the green room, and it was the week of his seventy fourth birthday. And I just said to Wayne, as you know, one of the icebreakers, you know, it's your birthday. What's on your mind? What's happening? And I said, "Look, if I'm lucky enough to make it to my seventies." Like, how do you celebrate the milestone? What do you do? And he just kind of smiled and he said, I ask myself a question every single birthday to mark the milestone. And I said, well, what's the question? And he said, did I live 74 years or did I live the same year 74 times? Yeah. And I remember wow. hearing that. And I remember saying to Wayne, I'm like, oh, dude, happy birthday to us, man. Like that. I'm like, that is good. That is deep. That is good. I'm going to, that's going to stay with me. And the value of that right now during the pandemic, as I say that many of you might be thinking, well, yeah, I felt like I've lived the same day over and over for the past year. Now more than ever mm. is our chance to be more intentional with how we're reaching out, mm. how we're connecting, how we're listening and breaking out of that autopilot mode of how we used to operate in the state of being busy. Like, I think it was, yeah, it was Tim Ferriss who said being busy is a form of laziness. Mm, sure. And it's so true. We can get so distracted and caught up in the sake of, oh, I've got to do this, I, uh, I'm doing that. And well, what are we really accomplishing if we don't have our health, if we don't have our loved ones, if we don't have our relationships? Because right. yes, career is important. Yes, relationships are important. But those relationships drive our health at the end of the day. And that's what we need to take care of. We need to recharge ourselves right now and do it in intentional ways. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. It's funny because I have a very similar story on, on something that, you know, that somebody said the same sort of impactful nature that uh, Dr. Wayne Dwyer had with you is someone once said to me, and I, I can't even remember where it came from originally, but I've, I've, I've thought about this many times over the years. And it was, when was the last time you did something for the first time? Right. Really? Like, like just, it was just cause I, you know, I, I think a lot of you know this now, but I've been learning how to fly helicopters in this last year. Right. I want to use this time to say I came out of the pandemic and I actually did something good with some time rather than just get, you know, stuck in front of the television in the evenings and instead I'm studying and doing ground school and a whole bunch of other stuff and, you know, and flying as much as I can. And, you know, I think we have to ask ourselves that, right. Like, you know, we get stuck in our, in our way. And it's funny because these podcasts, when we started it, I could have, you know, I could have held, held a really great podcast just on mortgage financing or working with mortgage professionals. But I really wanted these podcasts to be much more intimate and personal. I wanted to be able to pull in conversations like this, Riaz, that really resonate and help people in all areas of their life, right? And I wanted to open up to everyone. So, you know, um, 
you've just been a, a, a extraordinary guest. I, I, you know, I'm so grateful to have you here. It's such a riot. It's nice to be reconnected. We've been kind of texting back and forth for the last little while. It's good to see your face and I can't wait to get through this so I can give you an oversized hug, dude. Bring it on, man. We met in a cave in Mexico. Now we're in a Zoom cave. Soon yeah. we'll be back together. Yeah. Uh, brother, hugs and handshakes. Bring them on. I'm ready for them. Let's get through this. Let me ask you uh, one last question just as a takeaway. People are going to add it to their list. Is there, uh, obviously, guys, we're going to give away at least 50 of these today. But besides every conversation counts, is there another book along your way asking about the celebrity? But is there a certain book that, re that resonated with you in your life for that stands out to you for that you can share? Yeah. Do I have it here? Oh, it's not on my shelf. I think, you know what? I think I gave it to my wife to read during the pandemic. And this is why your connection when you allowed me to see Darren Hardy and talk to him was really special. It's the compound effect. I love the simplicity of trying one thing and doing it consistently and the momentum you could build. And that that's for all of us. If we want to build relationships, if you want to build relationships online through social media, how are we consistently showing up? Because if trust is the most precious commodity, this is such a great book, The Compound Effect. Uh, if trust is our most precious commodity right now, and whenever I'm doing a virtual keynote, the first question I'll ask leaders is, what's the number one quality you're looking for when you're building or nurturing a relationship? 90% mm -hmm. of the time, the word trust is dropped. Yeah. And if I... If I want to build a relationship, I keep in my mind consistency cultivates trust. And the compound effect is all about consistently showing up with, with these actions that are going to build powerful things for you in your lives. Uh, and if you haven't read it, check it out. I know you're probably all about it knowing you and Darren. Are, are yeah, yeah, yeah. We've had, as you know, we had, we've had Darren do do events for all of our owners, three-day events. We've studied his stuff for years. We we have him on uh, every so often as well. So I'm, I'm so glad that, that he was able to make an impact in your life like he has in mine over the years. Uh, when are you last, writing a book, Gary? When's your book coming out? Well, Gary? you know, we've been playing with the idea. Never say never. We, you know, it would have to be something very simple because I'm a bit of a simple guy, but uh, some standard, easy principles that we can all use and share. Uh, Riaz, the, the last thing that I'll, uh, I'll, I'll talk to you about here before we go is how do we get more Riaz? You're, you're doing some really cool stuff right now. Talk to us about where anyone on this call today that wants to go and listen to your own podcast, or I know you got a new experiment, a new program coming out. Can you share with us? I, I want to make sure that anyone who just goes, wow, that was fantastic. This guy is a very special human being. How do they find you? And what do you got coming up? Uh, thanks. Thanks for the question. Right now, uh, we're, we're, we're in book mode to share this message. I'm very passionate about it. Uh, obviously, you've heard about it for years. Uh, on the website uh, is details on how you can get the book if you're interested. One of the other things I really championed during the pandemic was I wanted to create, given the pain points that people were having with virtual communication, bosses became broadcasters in this space. And I piloted a program called The Magnetic Presenter uh, with leaders to elevate their, ex their experience, their presence, so they could lead virtually and most importantly, make an emotional connection. And next month I'm launching The Magnetic Presenter. We're taking applications now for people that are interested where it's a curriculum. It's gonna be an advanced presentation skills group coaching program that you'll get a video curriculum, but more importantly, uh, weekly, I'll be on the live coaching calls where people will be presenting some material and they'll be talking about pain points they're having with virtual you know, video calls and when we get back to in person. I want to elevate the game. So if you're in a room and you want to present and you want to move people, I want to share these ideas so I can help elevate you so you can be that star that people come to you and say, thank you for that inspiration. Thank you for that motivation. And maybe six months to a year after they've seen you, they're going to say to you, you changed my life. And that's the mantra of the book. We're one conversation away from changing someone's life. That's the goal, Gary. And we're going to have fun doing it. Absolutely love it. You know what? I'm so, uh, so thankful. Hey, dude, it was just always a pleasure. Whenever I spend any time, when we get a few minutes to chat, or in this case, an hour, I always walk away feeling like very warm. And, you know, I learn so much every time. So on behalf of, of our group, the DLC, the Level Up uh, program, the group of companies, our sponsor, First National, uh, everyone who tuned in on all of our social media channels. Riaz, thank you so much. Uh, really appreciate all of your time today. Can't wait to uh, to see you soon. To everybody on this call, we're going to sign off here. Our next guest in a couple of weeks is the former Premier of British Columbia, Christy Clark. Uh, can't wait to uh, talk with Christy. She is a dynamic individual. You want to talk about the power of uh, of of 
of uh, female leadership. Wow, this girl has got some incredible stories. Can't wait to have Christy on the uh, on the show. Riaz, to all of you, thank you very much, guys. Have a great afternoon and the balance of a great weekend. Enjoy the long weekend. Bye-bye now.